Isaiah 65, 17 through 19, and 23 through 24. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in its sound of weeping and the cry of distress. There shall be not labor in vain or bear children for chlamydity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, thanks. You guys, I gotta say, I'm seriously, um, just a sec, let me get this started up. I'm so excited to be here tonight um, because every time I walk into this room, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay, and I'm back. Um, Every time I walk into this room, it immediately feels like family to me. So even for those of you who I don't know well, I feel like I am among family tonight, and that, that's a good feeling. There's something special that God is doing on Wednesday nights in this room. But as, as we continue as a family, do you mind if I start with prayer? God, I am so grateful for the promises that Priya just spoke over us. The good promises that you give us in your word of the ways that you will restore and redeem and bring beauty out of ashes. But particularly some of those last words, God, when you promise that you will hear us when we speak, I am stunned by that. You say that even before the words are fully out of our mouths, God, that you hear us. And tonight I ask that, God, that that would not be a one-way street because Here in this room tonight, we long to hear from you. And God, I trust that you have already been speaking through the worship and through the experience we've already been a part of, but God, tonight would you use me? Would your spirit speak through me? In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Well, like I said, this room feels like family to me, but you might not know me very well. I might not necessarily feel like family to you, right? Uh, So just a little bit about me. My name is Nick Benoit. I am a creative director here at Willow, so this is not my usual gig. Um, But I've been here for about five and a half years now, and I want to introduce you a little bit to my family, if that's okay. So we're going to see a picture of them. And uh, my wife and I, we have three kids. Finden is our oldest. I know his name is unusual. He's 10 years old. And then Ellis is seven, and Ona, she just turned four last week. And my wife and I, Karen, we will have been married for 16 years, a week from tomorrow. So we'll be celebrating 16 years of marriage. But the really crazy thing is that she and I, Karen and I, we have actually known each other our entire lives. Because our parents literally started attending the same church before either one of us were born. And so we know everything about each other, right? But it's funny because some of her first memories of me, I probably looked a little bit more like this. I know, right? I was adorable. But newsflash, I've always had these ears, okay? But yeah, some of her first memories, I probably looked like that. But here's the thing that I really want to point out, is that between these two pictures, there's a lot of life right? I mean, between this adorable little boy and this other guy, there's like this middle ground, right? Let me give you a little glimpse of what that middle chapter looked like. Does anyone have a guess as to when this picture might have been taken? What? What? Eighth grade? Yes. Middle school. Can we all in this room just agree together right now that middle school is the worst? It is the worst. 
I mean, it's called middle school because it's, not, it's just between things. And so they don't know what to call it. It's just, it is awkward. I mean, the whole time, your voice is awkward because it will not cooperate. Your body is awkward because it just keeps surprising you. Your relationships are awkward because you and all your friends are at the same time trying to navigate this thing called maturity. And it's as as if you're all learning to drive stick shift and you're lurching forward and then stopping just to stall out. Middle school is when you've completely forgotten how to talk to the opposite sex. And middle school is when you are convinced that your features were somehow rearranged in a funhouse mirror. Middle school is the worst. Because you've left childhood behind, you've left that adorable kid behind, but you've not yet become that person that you have a hazy idea that someday you might be. But I would argue that sometimes our entire lives feel like we are in a perpetual state of middle school. We're neither here nor there, we are somewhere in between. And here's the thing, God's people, they get this. They get this idea of living in that middle ground. As we look through the Bible, the majority, the bulk of the stories that we read find our characters right in the middle. Shortly after we meet Abraham and Sarah, they're no longer the childless couple, but they're not yet the nation they've been promised they'll become. The Israelites, they're not still slaves in Egypt, but they haven't yet reached the promised land. And David, he's not still a shepherd boy, but he's not yet a king. And as I I look through the book of Isaiah, I realize that it's largely a book that's written to talk about what it looks like to live in the in-between. And we've been looking at the book of Isaiah for the last three weeks. This is the third week of it. We're closing down this book tonight. And we've been looking at it in three different pieces And the first piece was chapters 1 through 39, and Ashley spoke on this a couple weeks ago. And if you read through chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah, the thing that you're going to find is it's kind of mean. There's really harsh language in that, and it's because God is basically shouting to his people, you are doing this wrong. When you get afraid, when you get nervous... You run to all the other nations around you instead of running to me, instead of running to the one true God. But as we get to the very end of that that section, there's actually this one really beautiful moment where God's people actually trust him. They're surrounded by the Assyrians, and their chance of winning this battle is exactly zero. There is no chance of success And so Hezekiah, the king, he goes to God and he pleads on behalf of God's people. He says, will you please spare us? And God does. He sends an angel of the Lord and in one night, he slays 185,000 of the Assyrians and the battle is over before it begins. And so what does Hezekiah do? Does he turn to the one true God? Does he repent and thank God? No, he invites the Babylonians over to lunch. Instead of trusting in the one true God, when he gets nervous again, he hopes to align himself with other nations. So he invites them over and he literally opens the doors to the treasure troves of the kingdom. He shows them every nook and cranny of what Jerusalem has to offer. And so it's really no wonder that a few years later the Babylonians return and they take everything that they were shown including carting God's people off into captivity. And that's how, that's how the first part of Isaiah ends. Brings us to the second part of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 55. And Matt talked about this last week. And there is new language in the second part of Isaiah. I told you that the first part feels kind of mean. The second part, it's poetry. It's this beautiful poetry that's laced throughout the whole thing. Some scholars would argue that Isaiah, the second part of Isaiah, actually contains some of the most beautiful poetry in the entire Bible. There are some scholars, some even non-believing scholars, that would say that the second part of Isaiah contains some of the most beautiful poetry in all of antiquity. And why poetry? 
It's because God is giving people his, a dream. He's giving them something to look forward to, but the view, it's kind of hazy. It hasn't completely come into focus, and poetry is simply the best language to try to wrap our minds and hearts around dreams. And why do God's people need a dream? Because they're in captivity. They are, they are separated from their way of life. They are separated from their homeland. They are separated even from one another. They need a dream because today is really, really difficult. And that brings us to the third part of Isaiah, the part I want to talk about tonight. It's chapters 56 through 66. And this isn't the dire, harsh, kind of mean warnings, and it's not exactly the poetry, but in fact, it is actually both. The third part of Isaiah feels like a mishmash of all the pieces of the first two parts. And why? Because the people of God have finally seen the demise of the Babylonian Empire. After 60 plus years in captivity, the Babylonians have been defeated. And finally, these people are streaming back to their homeland and they have their minds and their hearts full of the warnings and full of the dreams that God has given them in the past. And then they arrive and what do their eyes behold? Isaiah describes it in chapter 64, verses 10 and 11. This is what they see when they get home. They're speaking to God. They say, your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem, the most precious city, the center of our culture, it's a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where our ancestors praised you. That place, God, that actually housed your presence, where our fathers and our fathers' fathers and the fathers before them lifted up your name, has been burned with fire. And all that we treasured, everything in this world that we held dear, lies in ruin. Their homeland is decimated. Their cities are decimated. Their temple is decimated. Their culture is decimated. And they're starting to wonder, is our connection to God decimated? The third part of Isaiah is written to people who need hope, who need a dream when things look absolutely hopeless. It is written to people who are living anything but a dream and who are asking is the dream even true? Is the dream even possible? They're neither here nor there. They are not living the dream. They are in the messy middle. They are living in the in-between. And here's the thing. As I read through the third part of Isaiah, I am convinced that it's also written for us who are not living the dream every day, who are not living in a happy ending just yet. We're living in reality. I'm convinced that 95% of our lives is actually spent in that messy middle ground between who we were and who we will be, between the rescue and the promise. I'm no longer that adorable child, but I'm not yet the person I'm going to be. I'm no longer a student in middle school, but I still have a lot left to learn. As a church, I'm sure you would agree that we are not the church that we were, and we're still working toward the church that we will become. For some of you tonight, you're no longer in that relationship, but you still have a lot of healing to do. And for a lot of us, we are no longer slaves to sin and death, but we are not yet the holy resurrected person that we will become. And Isaiah, he describes what it sometimes feels like to live in that in-between place. In Isaiah chapter 59, this is verses 9 and 10. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows, like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. 
God's using that language of poetry again to talk about what it sometimes feels like as we grope along the wall in the dark, hoping that we are making some progress, hoping we are moving toward a light that we can't hardly ever see. That image feels familiar to me. And I wonder if for some of you that feels familiar. And as I read it, I feel like God is saying to us, I get it. I see it. I know it. And I'm in it. But do you believe it? Living in the in-between is hard. It is a time of testing. Living in the in-between is a pop quiz that only asks one question. God is trustworthy. True or false? God is trustworthy. True or false? Because if it's true... If it's true that God is trustworthy, then his promises are true. If God is trustworthy, then the in-between, it's temporary. If God is trustworthy, then we will make it through. If, a small word with a big question. And you might find yourself asking that question right now because you are in a relationship that is in a no man's land. Maybe you have a vocation, a job, where you just feel stuck and you're asking, God, what, what do you want with this? Maybe you have an addiction for which you've been forgiven, but you can't completely shake it. Or you have some area of your life where hope seems to be failing and it feels like the darkness is closing in day, day by day and I have good news and frankly, I have hard news tonight. The good news is that the third part of Isaiah, I believe it is written to teach us how to live well in the in-between. The hard news is that there aren't any easy answers. What I really wish I could give you tonight is three easy steps to Pry yourself out of the in-between. But that's not how it works. There's no secret formula. What God gives us is the wall that we can grope along and still make progress even when we can't see the way. And that wall is God's trustworthiness. And there are three ways that we can cling to that trustworthiness. We can internalize God's trustworthiness. We can remember God's trustworthiness. And we can plead for God's trustworthiness. We can internalize it, we can remember it, and we can plead for it. The first thing we do when we find ourselves living in the in-between is we can internalize God's trustworthiness. One of the themes throughout Isaiah are just the promises of God. They seem to be written on almost every page, and he repeats them over and over. And Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21 is an example of just one of them. It's God speaking. He says, as for me, this is my covenant. This is my promise with them, with my people, says the Lord. My spirit, who is on you, will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forevermore. And then just one more time for good measure, says the Lord, period. He says early on in that, that this is his covenant. This is God's pinky swear. This is his promise. And the promises of God are the things that he will absolutely, undoubtedly, assuredly do. And he doesn't mince words here, does he? He is definitive. He says, my spirit will not depart. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. There's no loophole in my spirit will not depart. He says his words will always be on their lips for forever. He's not using words like, might, or maybe, or sometimes, 
Or if I feel like it, my spirit will be with you for the foreseeable future. His promises are true, but when we read a promise like that, a really good promise that God's spirit will never leave us alone, do we take it in? Do we internalize it? Does it really change the way that we live? My family and I, we just got back from a trip to California, and it was so good. California was so good because it has this thing called sunshine. (laughs) We're getting a little bit of it today, but get this. Our first full day in California was the day that it snowed five inches here. We timed it perfectly. But when we first started talking about the trip, I don't think the word California had even fully left my mouth before my kids started asking what? Disneyland, exactly. Dad, are we going to Disneyland? So my wife and I, we talked about it, and then one night at dinner, we made the announcement. Family, we are going to Disneyland. And a collective cheer went up from my three kids. They were like, yes! And then it was suddenly very subdued. It was not what I expected. It was excitement, and then it just kind of trailed off. And I didn't know what to do with that. And about a week later, we were having dinner with some friends at their house, and the kids had finished, so they were kind of in different corners of the room playing, and we're just sitting there talking with the other couple, and the other couple asked us, so are you going to go to Disneyland? And out of the corners of my eyes, in my peripheral vision, I see my children stop playing, and they turn to look. (laughs) And I'm like, yes, we're going to Disneyland. And then I watch as they return to playing. And after that, the questions started coming. They would ask me almost every day, Dad, are we going to Disneyland? Yes, we're going to Disneyland. Are you sure? I'm in charge of the plan. Yes, I'm sure. Do you have tickets? No, I don't have tickets, but I promise we are going to Disneyland. The promise for them was just too good to be true. It was too good for them to really wrap their hopes around. But then, one morning, my my parents were in town, and they woke up early with the kids and made a pancake breakfast, and they're sitting down. And my, my oldest, my son, he puts his hands on the table, and he leans in towards Grandpa, and he whispers, We're going to Disneyland. He just whispers it. And from that point on, everything changed. My girls, they started planning out which characters they were going to meet. They started laying out the dresses they wanted to pack. My son wanted to look at the map online so that he could plot our course through the park. It wasn't too good to be true any longer. It was just true. They believed it and they began to live like it was true. It changed what they did. When we hear the promises of God, everlasting life, unconditional love, abundant grace, those sound too good to be true, don't they? And I think that's why God keeps repeating them over and over and over. Because we have a choice, and I usually make the wrong one. I hold God's promises at arm's length. Because I'm too afraid to get disappointed. I'm too afraid of getting my heart broken. But instead, we can internalize the promises of God. We can hold them close. We can poke at them. We can ask him questions about them over and over again. We can whisper them aloud. We can begin planning and reorienting our lives around them. We can saturate our lives with them. We can read them in scripture over and over again. We can underline them in our Bibles. We can commit them to memory. We can let them into our hearts. And the more we do, the more we will begin to live like God's promises are true. We can internalize God's trustworthiness. And part of internalizing God's trustworthiness is remembering God's trustworthiness. This idea of remembering, of recalling the past, it's a theme throughout the entire Bible, of course. 
But we see it again and again through this third part of Isaiah. This comes from Isaiah chapter 63, verses 10 and 11. Really just 11. Then his people recalled the days of old. The days of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them through the sea? His people in a trying time when they have high hopes and expectations and they're looking at the decimation of everything, they remember, you know, God's been pretty good in the past. Do you remember the time that he brought us out of Egypt? That that was pretty good. They remembered that when God, when, when things were at their most terrible, God had a miracle. They're looking at the destruction, and God is saying to them, remember, remember that I have been good in the past. Remember that even when things look impossible, I have shown myself powerful. Remember that you can trust me. When we remember that God is trustworthy, we begin to entrust ourselves to him. When my family and I were moving from California to Chicago five and a half years ago, we did it in stages. Namely, my wife and the kids got to fly, and me and the dog got to drive. (laughs) And we were a couple days into this trip, and I pulled over because the dog was going stir-crazy and stressing me out. And I pulled off the highway, and I jumped a fence, and we played in this huge, it was probably a 10-acre field. And we just played for a while, and then we jumped the fence again, headed back to the car, and I reach into my coat pocket, and I do not have keys. And I know for sure they were in my coat pocket when we went out there. And so I'm looking at this 10-acre field, knowing that my keys are somewhere in it. And I pull out my phone to call for help, and there is no service. And you guys, this is four days before Christmas. It is winter in the Great Plains, and the sun is going down, and I am panicking. And I sit down in the middle of that field, and some of you have heard this story before, but the part that I haven't told is what I started thinking about as I sat down in that field, because my mind rewinded to several months earlier. Because the whole reason I was in that field in the first place was because I'd agreed to take a job at Willow. And that journey had culminated on another road trip. You see, when the opportunity for Willow first became, first became available, my wife and I, we weren't interested. <laughs> we were really, really happy. We felt called to where we were. We felt like God was using us in powerful ways. We didn't want to uproot our family. But then, you know, God starts talking. He started whispering. He started changing our hearts and softening our hearts. But let me tell you, we tried our absolute best to close every door and every window, seal down everything so that we could stay where we were. And one by one, God just kept opening those doors and opening those windows. And those whispers were starting to feel like shouts. But at one point in the journey, I was like, whispers aren't enough for me. If I'm going to uproot my entire family, I want to be 100% certain. Who am I to ask for 100% certainty? But that's what I wanted. So I talked to my wife and I was like, I think I just need some time alone. And road trips are always a good way for me to be alone. And I'd never been to the Grand Canyon. I was like, honey, do you mind if I go to the Grand Canyon by myself? And she said, sure. And so I start this drive and you guys... I am going 80 miles an hour across the desert. I have the radio turned all the way up. I am belting out 90s songs at the top of my lungs. And I'm a few hours into this solitary road trip meant for prayer, and I'm suddenly really convicted. It hit me really suddenly. I was like, okay, (laughs) this is not why I'm taking time away from my family. This is not why I'm taking this trip. So I roll up the windows and I back off 85 miles an hour a little bit. And I go and I I reach to turn off the radio. And as I do, I say a very simple prayer. I say, God, I'm sorry because I think I'm trying to avoid you. 
I'm afraid I don't want to hear what you have to say. But the whole reason I'm here is to hear from you. So God, will you speak? And I shut off the radio and I look back at the road. And just at that moment, I'm crossing a bridge. And you know how they sometimes have those green signs that mark bodies of water you're crossing? I was crossing Willow Creek. I wanted certainty. <laughs> God gave me a road sign about a body of water in the desert. Fast forward to a few months later, and I'm sitting in the middle of a field, and I'm stuck in the middle. And I start to remember that journey. I remember that over and over again, God has been faithful. God has been trustworthy. And so I say a prayer. God, you got me into this. And I know you know where my stupid keys are right now. <laughs> Will you help me? And you guys, no lie. I stand up and I walk 20 yards. I take a deep breath and I look down and my keys are at the toe of my boot. God is trustworthy. But so much of trusting in what God will do is remembering what he has done. When we are in the in, the in between, we have to remember that God is trustworthy. And finally, we need to plead for God's trustworthiness. God, like I said, he gives amazing promises in the book of Isaiah. He tells his people that he's going to restore them. Better yet, he tells them that they will be more prosperous and more powerful than they ever were before. Better yet, all the other nations will look at them in awe. And better still, the cherry on top, the Messiah, the one who will restore all things, all people, all creation, the savior of the world is going to come from them. God makes incredible promises to Israel. And then he tells them to plead for them to come true. Isaiah chapter 62, verses 6 and 7. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And give him no rest. Till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Call on the Lord, pray, plead, give yourselves no rest, and don't let God rest until the whole of his promise has come true. But that prompts a question for me. If we rest from pleading, if we let God rest, get a break from our voice, does that mean his promises won't come true? I told you earlier that the promises of God are the things that he will absolutely, undoubtedly, assuredly do. We don't plead because it will change God's promise. We plead because the pleading will change us. I came home from work one day, and I found my wife in the bedroom, and she was sitting on the bed, and she had this strange look on her face, and she says, I have good news. We're going to have a third baby. <laughs> and this was so crazy for us, because both of us, we come from two children households, and so wrapping our minds around three was this new adventure, but we did. We started wrapping our minds and our hearts around it. And as we headed into the second trimester, we went in for an appointment, and they put the machine to Karen's skin to hear the baby's heartbeat. And then they tried another spot. And another spot. And I remember that in that silence, the hum of the air, condi air conditioning felt impossibly loud. And it became pretty clear that we didn't need to be listening anymore. At first, I couldn't talk to God about it at all. I was too angry. But then at some point, I did begin to plead with him. And it was simple. I just said, will you take the pain away? Dear God, will you please just help this hurt a little bit less? And then I started pleading differently. I said, why? 
Why would you do this? Why was our first appointment with the doctor so late? Why did you give us so much time to wrap our minds and hearts around it? And then it was a different why. As I saw my wife getting ready emotionally to try again, I said, why in the world would we do this again? Why would we set ourselves up for that kind of heartbreak? And then it changed to, should we? I mean, our life is pretty good. Do we really need another? How is it going to change life? How is it going to affect our other two? I started creating lists of pros and cons. And then one morning, really late at night at 2 a.m., I woke up suddenly. and I couldn't get back to sleep, and I went and I checked on our other two kids. And then somewhere between there and going to get a glass of water in the kitchen... I suddenly had a different question in my mind and heart and it was totally unprompted by me, let me tell you. Because suddenly, the question in my mind and heart was why wouldn't we? If God has something of his kingdom that he wants to bring through a person that we could bring into this world, why wouldn't we want to be a part of that? And let me tell you, that was not a question that I would have asked on my own. But after months of pleading with God, something had changed. It had reoriented my questions from being about what I want to what God wants to do in the world. And hear me loud and clear. I am not saying for a moment that God promised us a child. He didn't. That was not the promise he gave me. But the promise he gave me, the promise he gives to all of us, is that he has plans to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. And at the start of my pleading, I did not believe in those plans. I did not have hope. I could not see a future. But as I pled with God, he changed me and he changed my promises. Not everything in life comes with a promise, but some things do. When God says that he will forgive, he will. When God says that he will redeem, All the lost causes, he will. When God says that he will restore the broken and ugly places, he will. When God says that someday we will be with him, we will. When God says that he will be faithful, he will. When God says that he is trustworthy, he is. When God promises us, he tells us to be relentless. He tells us not to rest and not to let him rest, to plead with him until his promise comes true. But here's the thing. Since we spend most of our lives in this in-between place, I know that it's easy to lose heart. I've been there. There are places in my life right now where I'm there right this moment. I have relationships right now that feel like they are in that no man's land in our church, in my job for the last 12 months, it has felt like nothing, if not the in-between. You guys, I have areas of brokenness where I know I've been forgiven, but I don't yet feel free. I'm right in the middle. I'm sure you have them too. And as we're groping along in the dark, hoping we're still making progress, clinging to God's trustworthiness. It's easy to just want to find an easier way. But there is no easy way out of the in-between. But when we are there, the question remains, God is trustworthy, true or false? As we cling to that wall of God's trustworthiness, we can internalize it we can begin to live like those promises might actually be true. We can remember it. We can remember that he has been good in the past and will be good for our future. And we can plead with God until his promises come true. And here's one more thing, one more very important thing, that when we find ourselves stuck between here and there, we should remember that God is near. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15 says this, For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place. But also, 
hear this, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, with the one who's lost hope, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You guys, he is both. He is in a high and holy place and he is right here with you. Jesus was in a high and holy place and just as the entire book of Isaiah prophesies, he left a high and holy place to come down to this in-between place so that we could sometime, someday take our place with him. And so even sometimes in this lonely middle ground, we need to remember that God is with us. He went to incredible lengths to come near and he is, he is near. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for all of your promises, but most of all right now, I just want to thank you for that one that says that you are close. That you are right next to us, that you are in us, God, that you are with us even when we feel like we're in the in-between. And for those tonight who they're not, they can't see the light, they feel like that blind person, they're not even sure they have a hand on the wall. God, would you lead them to the wall of your trustworthiness? God, will you begin to show them glimpses of the ways that you come through? Will you work on their memory and help them to see the ways that you have come through in the past? And get, will you give them the courage to plead for your promises? God, even in these next moments as we turn our hearts and our eyes and our mouths to praise you, God, would you draw near to us? In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.